What is up, everybody? Uh, welcome to the, uh, I mean, we're, we're kind of calling this whole thing the CCS Plus show, which is very cute, as you can see. Uh, but uh, tonight, we're here with Neil Shoemaker, uh, Design Director of Footwear at Vans for Skate. Uh, for Skate, right? Or is it, what's your official title? Uh, I oversee the Skate category in this other, like, kind of lifestyle, non-classics-based category called Classics Plus. So Neil does that for Vans. Uh, and basically, I'm just going to talk with Neil. I'm going to ask him questions. He's going to answer them. And then uh, we'll talk about some shoes he's designed. Uh, and then after that, you guys will be able to do a Q&A. If you want anything you want to ask Neil about Vans or about shoes or about anything we talked about in the little uh, Q&A. So we're going to dive in. Uh, Neil, how are you tonight, first and foremost? I'm good. I'm good. Thank yeah. you. How are you Got doing, Matt? I'm, I'm great, dude. I'm, I, I just complain. cracked a beer. The kids are asleep. <laughs> it's a good way to celebrate the end of the day. It's, I find with this quarantine, like, dude, drinking, if you drink, is kind of essential at, like, your, your six o'clock or whenever you're done working. You have to, like, pour a drink to know that your day is kind of over. <laughs> yeah, it, like, marks the end of the work day. <laughs> yeah the only difference you have in your life so neil you are from arizona so a little backstory for you guys neil and i grew up we're from the same town in arizona from mesa uh so mm -hmm. i've known neil since i don't know probably like we were eight i was maybe 17 or 18 how old are you uh, how old are you now i'm 38 right, so, so a few years older than you right? yeah you're probably finishing college uh when i met you right Does that makes sense yeah maybe okay. So, uh, so grew up skating in Arizona. Um, when did you get into shoes? Like, aside from the obvious, like when you are a skater, you're obviously into shoes as much as you need shoes all the time and shit. But like, when did you really start like taking a notice to shoes in a, in a different way? Well, I'd say that was kind of the start of it. Like I worked at a couple skate shops, Salvation and Freedom. And um, shoes were kind of the most interesting part of, you know, the products in the store. And the things I was most hyped on and then I think that that kind of led me into um, a product design uh, degree at ASU and that was a way you know I always kind of had shoes in my mind as something that would be fun to do fun to design apparel as well but that kind of led me to this product design degree and as a, and that in turn led me to sort of stay in skateboarding in a way just because I liked you know I liked the act of doing it and I knew I wasn't ever going to try to be a sponsored skater or anything like that but you know, I like to be around it. And like, I went skating this morning with some friends from work before we started work. And it's just, it's fun to do. You're next to skating and you're like, I want to stay in skating, but I suck at skating. How can I try and live this lifestyle as close to it as possible without yeah, having, having to be pro? Uh, but yeah, so I, I found, I found through a friend, this um, design degree at ASU, um, chatted with some kind of like kind of camp counselors at it, figured out it was kind of right for me. And then I sort of transferred from a community college where I was going to get like a teaching certificate and like, I'm going to just try to do this design degree thing. And then in the fall at ASU, went through that, went through four years of school. During that time, I worked at, um, you know, those skate shops and I was going to trade shows, kind of doing some buying, um, getting a little bit more responsibility in that way. And through that, I kind of had some like sales rep connections that ended up introducing me to a few people at some brands. So there was a point where I think one spring I had this kind of crappy little portfolio of stuff I'd done in school. And I had taken that to the trade show being like, I'm going to try to get myself an internship somewhere uh, for the summer because it's super hot in Arizona and I need to leave. Um, and Vans was receptive, uh, the, the most receptive. And I ended up, ended up working out and I got an internship that summer and it was kind of like set me on a path. There was rad people there. Um, seeing their process of working, they got to travel, um, interacting with skateboarders, just kind of like creating and making new things um, and new shoes in all different types of ways was, was really exciting to me. And so at, after that, I was kind of like, I got to finish school and get back here. Damn, so you, the same way skaters used to like go to the trade show with their sponsor me tapes, like you basically took your sponsor me tape to be a designer. <laughs> kind of, kind of. Um, I think I got, I, got, I got a little lucky though, because I found out later like, Vans didn't really have an internship program. And I, I sort of got in because somebody had quit. This dude, Charles, who I'd never met, had quit. So they had an empty chair and a desk for me. And then I was also, um, at Vans at the time was located on Shoemaker Avenue. They made shoes and my last name was Shoemaker. So the dude that hired me was, I think, pretty enamored by just this like huge coincidence of those three things aligning. So I, I, I really think that's what got my foot in the door. But yeah, then they, they like they liked me enough to like want me back, I guess. So your name might have actually gotten you a shot at all this shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> that's so rad. Well, uh, I was gonna ask. Let's let's rewind a little. I wanted to know uh, what was like when you were growing up skating. Like, what was the first shoe, or was there a standout shoe that that like you took notice as like, oh, that's sick. Like the first shoe that kind of the first maybe brand or any pro model maybe or something that kind of like, I don't know, that, that kind of changed changed how you looked at shoes almost. Is there anything like that or any moment like that for you? Um. I guess like some of the, the f early S stuff comes to mind, like the first Costin. I really like the second Costin too. Um, old action shoes, um, even like America back then. I think just as I got more into skating, I was kind of fascinated with the wear of skate shoes. And so maybe those things weren't necessarily like the best performing, at least for what I was doing, but I was I was pretty like interested in how they wore down and you know you end up like shoe gluing or adding duct tape and these different things to like make it last and i think through just that act of doing skateboarding um and wearing your shoes out I, that kind of got me more and more interested in it so you're kind of like uh inspired by the idea of like how do you make a skate shoe last better how do you make it like perform better kind of i don't know that's kind of going a little bit too far for like 17 year old me but i just was like interested in all that the wear of those things and like you know they were they were, they were durable and they were chunky back then but they still felt good and i, I remember thinking i looked cool back then that's um, true you're you're supposed to give yourself more credit though you're supposed to be like yeah man at 17 i just knew <laughs> that i was obsessed with how the house suede sat and stitched together <laughs> no i i appreciate that but i don't think i was that smart <laughs> all right so so you got stoked on shoes. You got you gave your sponsor me tape to Vans essentially, and then they sponsor, they, me, sponsor me folder of pictures. Sponsor me folder, and then uh, I remember you were you were staying on a mattress on Mike Stanfield's floor in his living Correct. room, right? Because that he, was really yeah. Neat. I I paid him a little bit of a rent to sleep in this corner in his living room. It was great. That was awesome. Yeah, I remember coming out a lot that summer and just seeing you the whole time and you were doing the internship. And, and then, so it pretty much, was it immediately after the internship or did you finish school and then uh, you got a job there? Or how, how, how did that all come about? Um, I, I had finished that off. That was just like a three month thing over the summer. Um, but they, they liked me enough. There was a few people that were like, dude, you should just keep working, like transfer to a school out here. You'll be fine. Um, but then a couple like you know, like the sort of the lead designer there. And then the, the person who was ahead in, in charge of the product category was sort of like, it's really important to get your degree. You know, everyone seems to like you here, go back and do that. And we could probably find a place for you. So I always kind of had that in my mind and then not really thinking much of it. I still had two years of school left at that point, by the way, but um, before maybe about six months before I got out of school, um, one of the designers, John started contacting me and been like, Hey, do you want to, you know, are you still down to, to, to work when you finish? We, we're going to have a job opening up. And so I had this like opportunity where I really had to do nothing. So I had, um, I had colleagues in school who were trying to build portfolios and find jobs and do all these things. And meanwhile, I had sort of a position that they were holding for me at Vans. So I got really lucky in that way that I made um, a good enough impression in my internship. And then also like within that time, they were able to, to kind of, um, have an open position waiting for me as well. Yeah, that's the nice, that must have felt good to know that that was kind of there. Yeah, it was, it was incredible, but also just sort of like unbelievable. I remember going out there, um, I think maybe like a week or two before I graduated. And I was expecting like, oh, I'm gonna have to go in and, um, you know, talk to the head of design, Mark, and like negotiate my salary. And like, I don't, I have no idea. I've never had like a career type job before. I worked at like skate shops and doing odd jobs and stuff. So I didn't know what to do. And so I went in there, I was like, so um, I think I still have a job. Like, do we, do we talk about like when I start, what, you know, what I'm going to get paid? And they're like, oh no, no, no. Someone from HR should have reached out to you. That hasn't happened already. It's like, no, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, come on. You don't so, even know what HR is at that point. Yeah, 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 right. So that was like a little a little odd, but it ended up working out. And um, yeah, I started in June of 2008. So it's been like just over 12 years. Okay. So what, what was your position when you started? Did you start as a designer or did you start as something lower than that? or? No, it was just like an entry-level designer. And I, I was like a, just an entry-level designer on the skate category. And so I was primarily focused on, um, at that point, it was like colors of existing models. I was kind of contributing to um, new concepts, but not necessarily like taking on the full responsibility of um, working with an athlete and dealing with a lot of that stuff. Um, and then also just like 
helping out with other projects. Like I was down to do um, designs for other categories, women's shoes, sandals. I worked on a snowboard boot. Like I was just sort of like hungry and down to do whatever, which that, that's kind of what I did as an intern too. Um, since they didn't have a, a, like a proper internship program, I was just sort of like, hey, what do you need help with? Like, that looks rad. Can I, you know, can I help you with things? And I was just trying to make myself sort of useful um, and not get in the way. And I think that was just, you know, that kind of stuff is appreciated if, if you show up and you just start helping people with stuff that they don't want to do. I think, yeah, I think it's pretty rare that you're going to meet a 20 year old kid who's like real proactive in the workplace like that, like trying to find stuff to do. So I think that's probably a, a good I was look. just, I was just psyched to be there and like trying not to fuck it up as much as possible. That's working in the skateboard industry. You're just like, don't cook it. Don't cook it. <laughs> yeah, basically. Sick. So after that, um, what was, uh, do you remember like the first, I was going to say, was there a first project that uh, felt like a big deal to you or like some, whether it was a shoe or working with an athlete or whatever, the first kind of like time you you worked on something that you felt like i don't know like it was a step up or like a big deal compared to what you've been doing i mean i'd done like colors of stuff and i actually as an intern i designed i got to design a shoe and an outsole from scratch but i, I just sort of i participated in our kind of design review process they liked what i presented up to the final one that ended up getting made but i wasn't actually the one kind of doing um, revisions and making sure like the drawings actually got to, you know, the, the final physical product. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say I like saw that thing through, but it was my kind of like initial concept that made it out. But um, once I started full time, uh, the first shoe I think that kind of came to market that was my design was this uh, Anthony Van England shoe called the AV6. It was a pretty simple kind of like a combination of an era and an old school, but I was just psyched to like have some interaction with Anthony and he liked this concept and we kind of like saw it to market and looking back, like there was a lot of things like, you know, you'd obviously do differently, but I was just excited to like work with someone like that, that I was always really psyched on. Um, sure. And then it actually like came to market with his name on it. Kids were skating in it. Kids seemed psyched on it. And like, that was kind of ultimately like, even to this day, like you just want to make stuff that people are psyched on and makes sure. them feel good. And like they, they remember and like they feel better about themselves when they go skating. For sure. What, I mean, do you still get that today? If you see someone, I mean, probably there's a lot of shoes now you've had your hand in, if not designed yourself. Like when you see people skating shoes you've designed, like, is it still kind of that same, oh, yeah. same feeling? That's the best. I mean, I, I just think it's awesome when you see like someone wearing like a torn up, beaten up, but like loved pair of shoes at a skate park or something. Yeah. Hell yeah. What, uh, was it scary the first time you, you, you met Anthony and worked with him? Cause he, out of all the people on the Vans team, I would say he seems like the most, I, I know he's not intimidating ultimately, but he's, he's scary. Like if you don't know him, he's a scary dude. Definitely. I'm, I'm also still like a bit on edge around him a little <laughs> bit just because he's like kind of dry and he's funny, but I don't think he opens up to a lot of people. You know, I, I'm, I'm definitely not one of them, but, um, yeah, he's rad. And like, I think I have a good working relationship with him now, but it's still like a little bit of like, I don't want to bum him out. I just want to like make sure he's psyched on stuff. And yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, it's like the little kid in me coming out being like, I, you know, I loved your part in photosynthesis, but I obviously don't want to tell him that. Totally. You know what? <laughs> he shows up to design a shoe and you just turn into the Chris Farley show. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no one wants that. Um, so let's, uh, let's switch to a different shoe. Um, you, you designed Kyle Walker's first shoe, right? Yep. So uh, let's talk about that. I feel like that shoe for uh, for us at CCS that shoe did really well. I know that was one of like one of our most popular hundred kickflip videos. It was requested a ton when the shoe came out. Um, I remember also feeling like when the shoe was, came out, it, it had a good maybe there was other shoes before it, but it had a good mix of like the classic van style with a lot more support. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was kind of the start of maybe something that happened with the next with a bunch of pro models after that. Um, I don't know if I'm, maybe I'm just making that up. I don't know. But I think it was kind of like a, a cool, I don't know. It's a shoe that I noticed, I took notice of, and I took notice to other models after it kind of seemed to be similar. Just uh, maybe walk through the process of that. What was it like designing that shoe with Kyle or like how much, how much input does someone like Kyle have on a shoe or Anthony or anyone like as a pro? They, they have a good amount. And, and like with Kyle specifically, like we obviously want to create something that they're psyched on um, as well as works for them functionally but then you know we want to make sure that it's not duplicating something that the category already has or that the brand already makes so yeah. kyle's case was an interesting one in that like we had gilbert crockett's first shoe which was similar it was like a low top clean vamp had a side stripe waffle cut bottom um, and he loved skating in that shoe 
And so we were like, okay, that's great. Gilbert Shoe exists. It's still going to exist. So we just want to kind of push you on like, what do you want to do to make it different? I think ultimately, like we were trying to push him a little bit on styling. Gilbert's was very like heritage kind of based and simple. And whereas like Kyle was a little fresher. So we were trying to get him to step out a little bit more um, with maybe some more like athletic detailing. And so I think, I think we got to a place there where, you know, initially that was like his first new shoe project. And I think he was like a little apprehensive, but once he started to see samples and skate in them and wear them, um, he was getting more psyched and psyched and um, starting to kind of um, trust us a little bit more. That seems to be kind of the case overall is like just building that trust. Yeah, we got him to a point where I'm, I mean, he was psyched and like the shoe has done well for Vans overall. I mean, for CCS too. But yeah, we, we kind of start there, show him sketches, go back and forth. Um, you know, if we have a concept for what like the construction, the outsole, the insole are going to be, we talk through all that and we try to get um, wear test samples and molds open as quick as possible. So those athletes can test them along with our own internal wear testing just to make sure there's no hot spots or anything isn't weird. We have to make adjustments. What's um, a hot spot? You, like, is that spot where, where it would like hurt your foot or where it tears fast or any kind of bad spot? <laughs> yeah, it's almost like anything, but usually it's like where maybe you get some kind of lumpiness of the upper or two layers of material are overlapping and you get some irritation or something. It's, it's not really a technical term, but, um, but that makes it makes sense. Yeah, like, that's it's just saying. like any anything that could go wrong, we try to solve with them as soon as possible because we don't get you know we get like a couple rounds of wear tests, but it takes a while to like open an outsole mold. Then you know if we have to do another one, make revisions to that mold and and or make revisions to that those blueprints and then open another one like that could be ten weeks in between molds. Gotcha. It's such a footwear is an insane process as far as like from conception of an idea to actual market like when you get there it seems crazy. yeah it's it's like an 18 month calendar so next tuesday we have our final design review for spring 22 um kind of like the spring 22 season so every category is kind of you know working towards their spring 22 concepts and next Never week like the, the 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 department kind of aligns on those last concepts and then we have to start tech packing it out and building those outsoles and uppers and stuff the tech pack is when you create like a essentially like a PDF or something that you deliver to the factory that has specifics of how the shoe's made. Yeah. Right? It's kind of like, yep. I was going to say, it's kind of, I always think about this with, especially with designers for apparel or shoes that are working a year and a half out. It seems, it seems crazy. Like when you're in that schedule, like you can never stop it because you're so far out, you know, like when do you actually, when are you able to ever stop or like, I don't know. I yeah. always think about like, what if you just died? Like you're just like, that <laughs> stuff is just, you never even get to see it. It's just a crazy I don't know. I've never worked on that far out on anything. So it always feels insane to, to hear those timelines. I, I think about it in similar ways where it's like, not, not what if I just died, but it's like, what if I get fired? And it's like, yeah. not, not a big deal. The company will go on like Vans is still Vans without me. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. But it is crazy because um, it, it puts you into like the net you're living in the next year almost as a designer who's working on stuff, you know, for a year and a half in advance, you're always kind of like living in the future almost which is yeah. probably interesting to how it bleeds into the rest of your life it probably is helpful in the rest of your life actually for like planning and things like that but it, it seems like a crazy it seems like it would mess with your head i don't know it, for me yeah. it always feels like oh man you're just in the future all the time um i'm on my work computer do you want me to uh share screen i can kind of click through some of that yeah stuff if you from... if you have some stuff from kyle shu i would love to see that i was gonna ask you about the waffle cup in general was that the first time that like the waffle cup was that like the first use of that construction in the Kyle shoe? Um, no, it, it actually started, it started on um, this project called the stage four, which was like a, just a team shoe. I think it mm -hmm. came out in 2012. Um, and it was a, it was a pretty simple upper. There was like a low top and a mid top, but um, Gilbert Crockett, as I mentioned, he had a waffle cup shoe. He was involved in that project. Mm -hmm. It was like him, Chris Banner, Shima Ferguson and um, Andrew Allen. And so through like their insights and we kind of started from like a blank cup sole shoe and a blank vulcanized shoe to get them something new as a team shoe project. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately we arrived at this kind of combination of both, which is how we got to the waffle cup. And then Gilbert, Gilbert really, really liked it. And then he had an opportunity to do a signature shoe, you know, whenever that was a couple of years later. So gotcha. that's what he, he keyed in on. And um, it was actually like his shoe was a pretty solid success. And then Kyle's on top of that. 
Gilbert has a second shoe. We just put out a high top shoe with him. Saw that. It looks, I, I think I was when I was talking earlier about Kyle's shoe. Maybe I was giving Kyle's shoe the credit that Gilbert's shoe. Maybe I meant Gilbert's shoe because I remember maybe it was the first time. I think the Kyle one sticks out because of the commercial with the actual waffle cup guy. And yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that is the power of marketing right there, right? Because I was like, <laughs> oh, waffle cup. That's a Kyle Walker thing because of the commercial. And I thought of that the, like, the whole. You're supposed to, you're supposed to remember the skating, man. I don't. I don't even remember what the trick was. I just remember that big dude and the big old, the big costume. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, but yeah. If you want to share the screen and uh, see anything about the um. All right. So it was shoot. fall 2016. These were like some of the sketches that we would have presented to him. That one's kind of close to what we ended up at. Cool. So do you do you actually draw the sketches or? Yeah, are these they... are like these are like marker and pen. That's so probably a is... fun part of the process, actually getting to draw on paper. You know. Yeah, I don't do it as much anymore, so I kind of feel like I have to relearn how to draw every time. <laughs> but it is it is pretty fun. Like that's that's like one of the the really enjoying parts about the job. Um, yeah. So these are all just kind of concepts. Like this probably was too close to Gilbert Shue. Um but we were trying to push him on just like outsole detail, which is why you see some differences in like. Extra know, there sculpt, and stuff. Sculpting and little little kind of notches in that one, little cutaways and like the heel and the midfoot. This was like just sort of an exploration on what the sidewall and the bottom could look like, kind of quick sketches to show him. So is that really... when you see the bottom of the sole, is that just the is the colors just different or is that different sole construction you're highlighting there? Um, I think this one was like, like this one that's on screen now was kind of meant to be a, like a, a mold, you'd have like a molded foam midsole and then the cup would be cradled around it. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. yeah. So then like this, this kind of part would be just like exposed foam just to shave some weight a little bit. We kind of ended up something similar to this, but like we were trying to, to add some, um, you know, like some relief into the, the waffle cup part where you'd see the foxing through it with some texture and that would help save some weight. But ultimately, like it was just, he wasn't psyched on it. It was harder for us to produce. This is fun. I feel like I'm seeing stuff I'm not supposed to see, even though this is from like four years ago. So this was like, this is pretty close to the final concept actually. And like, this is maybe kind of rare where a lot of the same lines like kind of still exist. You know, we had this like, we have this embossed toe, there's like this Duracat material, which is like a reinforcement to make the shoe last longer behind the toe. The seam ended up staying in the same spot. Like we already had a triangle kind of tongue detail on there. There's a little pull tab. Um, this little dip in the sidewall ended up being a little higher just because Kyle was kind of reacting to how, you know, he wanted it, he wanted it straighter, ultimately. He wanted it to look like a classic, kind of like just a, a closer to the classic sole. Yeah, I think so. But we had we had some like more cup details. Like we had waffle cup kind of embossed into the side. We have this relief with like the cup sole stitch. So there's like added support, making sure that thing stays on there. You know, when he's he's hucking, that guy looks loves to huck. Loves those rails. I was gonna ask too when you're when you're working with a skater and trying to pitch them, it's probably difficult sometimes because I mean we all know as skateboarders like most skaters want to wear like a black suede shoe with a white sole. I feel like that's gonna be the most common thing. But when you're trying to sell a skater on like a new technology or a new look or something, I'm sure that's like a, a bit of a dance to have to do to get them excited about something new sometimes. Yeah, and the way the way we kind of we kind of build it out is like, yeah, we'll always have a black one. Of course, you want a black one. The brand wants a black one. But um, you know, what what other colors would you be really psyched on to wear? And what other materials do you really want to try out? We'll you know we'll we'll do stuff on the side with those guys. We're like, hey, if you ever have any ideas you think might be crazy or you just want to see, like we'll make it for you. We'll make it in your size. If you're psyched on it. Maybe it'll make it in line. If if not, then you know, no big deal. But at least we can kind of try stuff. Yeah, who who comes with the craziest ideas? Kyle's pretty good. He's really down for color and like we've done a bunch of like floral patterns and paisleys and like he'll find a material, take a photo of something when he's out like traveling and just be like, what about this? Can I do something like this on my shoe? Okay, we'll we'll try to find something and we can sample it if you're down. Well, yeah, he did have the pink ones I just remembered that were pretty pretty wild like for yeah well, this is kind of later but when you oh, see wow. the when you see the part it's just like we'll make these little revisions um like this has a little you know we had to recess it further um but this is sort of how like the outsole blueprints show up and we you, know, you make these little changes on, on the um on the 2d views and then the um our kind of like development counterparts in asia will make the revisions in the 3d file so your show, you, when you send this off to a factory, you are you, down to the millimeter explaining yeah. like it's, it's, it's very like precise. 
it's all it's all in millimeters. This is a sh this is like a shell pattern revision. So we make revisions to the upper. They come in these like flat patterns, almost where the shoe looks like it's it's sort of been cut in half directly down the center of the top of the shoe and splayed out flat. And then so we're like, oh, we need to raise the the collar height and the heel a little bit. So that's what this blue line is. Oh, and we wow. X out the line we don't want. Like if this revision, it looks like everything was just kind of like sitting pretty low. So almost everything in the heel got like shifted up a little bit. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. It looks like a, a John Madden like play by play thing. <laughs> it looks so confusing. Yeah, I think it looks it looks like a lot more intricate than it actually is. Even like those blueprints I just showed, like I don't create that blueprint. We get given that and then we just kind of have to parse through it and make little comments too. Gotcha, gotcha. So the factory provides that for you? Yeah. So, so how many, I guess, so how many revisions, you might have said this earlier, how many revisions do you get basically from the first time you send them a tech pack to when the final shoe is produced? What's the, the amount of, uh, I guess, versions of the shoe you get to see in hand before it comes out? It depends on how long it takes. Sometimes you can do, I mean, you'll, you'll nail a shoe in, I don't know, two, three revisions. It's pretty rare to do it in like one or two, but some people have, depending on like the simplicity or what the concept is. Um, sometimes it just takes longer, but usually with something like this, where there's a new outsole, um, new upper and you're dealing with an athlete who like it really they really have to be able to perform in it and feel confident it, it usually does take a while like I think we went through two or three outsole molds just to get like the bonding properly and make sure everything's kind of situated in there and also for Kyle to feel good about just the the shapes and the stance and kind of the the platform that was underneath his feet so this is where you know we're we've the shoe is the shoe, but then in this in this kind of um, this file, we're showing like what the materials are, um, what we're specking out like Pantone colors. I think this was the marketed color too. It was just like an all white with a blue bottom and kind of little leather details. The sizing is crazy to me. I think just because it's also there's so many small pieces, you know, and like having seeing these tiny measurements is always so like crazy to me that like, you're like oh yeah change this by 0.2 millimeters you know because it, it does yeah. it's like when you're skating a board and you go from a 775 to a 787 like you notice it you know which sounds mm -hmm. ridiculous but i mean you're on a whole nother level with shoe stuff i'm sure and whether it's like protection on the top of your foot um or even cushioning under your foot those little things like half a millimeter makes such a difference in like what you perceive you feel about your board or like your you know the quality of your flick or something like all those things make such a difference it makes total sense and it's honestly a it's a terrifying concept to think about getting into that because it's, there's enough shit on a skateboard that you can be like oh like you talk to people and they're like oh i only skate jessup or i only skate mob and i'm like oh thank god i'm not a grip tape person but i'm like a wheelbase person if my wheelbase yeah. is 14 and a quarter rather than 14 i lose my shit and like, as you add in different things, you can understand about measurements of what you're skating. I feel like you can just get crazy. I, I think you know. can just cho like choose where to do that. Like some people do that with wheels. Some people do that with trucks. I probably do it with shoes. I don't know. What's your like? What's your personal like a uh, construction or materials or or cup or cup versus Volk? Like, what's your ideal shoe to skate? I think I'm skating some old school pros right now, but I go back and forth. I think. Slip-ons I really like, mostly because they're like thin and easy to break in, but they still feel pretty secure. Um, I liked half caps for a really long time. We did a shoe for Ave recently with a clear bottom. I was pretty psyched on that. That was like a pretty different construction for Vans, but also felt really good. Yeah, that one. Let, let's talk about that one a little actually, because that shoe, okay. I've, I've, I skated the shoe and it's really good. And I... And I don't mean to pigeonhole the shoe. I'm not trying to say it's an old guy shoe, but a lot of dudes in their 30s and 40s that skate have I've had conversations with them about how that's a, they're like that's the shoe. Like I've talked to a few people that are like that's the only shoe I skate now because they're they're a dude who skated a Vans their whole life and wants to still keep to that slimmer construction. But you yeah. get older and your feet hurt and everything is just a little harder. And that Ave Pro shoe I think has kind of filled the hole for skaters I skate with at least. Yeah, I think I share some of those saved sentiments and it's it's like a, the outsole is pretty durable. Um, it does take a bit longer to break in, at least for me. I don't get to skate as much as I maybe used to when I was like 23. Oh, um, weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I'm just excited that that thing feels good. Anthony's psyched on it. Other people like you and your buds out in the world are psyched on it. Um, 
that's just kind of like a good feeling that like we can kind of try something new or try something maybe unfamiliar to vans and it gets a strong response. Totally. I think that there's like, I remember when the ultra range came out, it was like a, whoa, vans is making like almost like not a running shoe, but like a, a an athletic shoe, you know, it mm-hmm. felt like that. And then from there, there's been, you know, it seems like a shift in some of the new designs to be a little bit more tech, which right off the bat to me is like, well, that's not Vans, you know, like Vans yeah. to me, the most tech of Vans can get is authentic pro where I'm like, Oh, it's an authentic that just hurts a little less and lasts longer, you know? And, but I, with, uh, with someone like Anthony too, like, is he, he's pretty on board with the technology and like the new stuff in the new shoe. Yeah. So that, that shoe, like we had kind of his two previous shoes, like we had a shoe called like the, it was called the AV rapid weld. And that was, it was, pretty similar in the like the the upper paneling and the way you know everything on the the top part of the shoe looked in that it had it was an all no so upper um it had kind of a similar like cap toe thing with a with an ollie guard that was no sewed on and that all that came from him like i think we were initially like when we started that project we thought he was going to do another heritage thing but he kind of came in being like i you know i'm i every time i walk my dog i have to wear these these like stupid athletic shoes and I hate looking down on them, but they feel good and they're flexible and they're breathable and they use like they use these new materials and like, can we do something like that? And we're like, oh, we didn't think you'd be psyched on something like that. But like, yeah, we're really, we're really down for that. We, those first two, we still kind of grounded it on a classic Vans vulcanized sole with our drop in footbeds, mm-hmm. um, which I think worked for him. But he was still like you're saying with some of the other old guys, like he needed more support. He was down for something to add a little bit more structure and better heel fit. And so we kind of proposed that to him. It was like, Hey, we can do this translucent um, rubber cup sole with a full length kind of uh, molded midsole in there and give you, you know, a little bit more support, like a better kind of platform to stand on and then also provide you with a better heel fit. So I think, that sort of trust that was built up over, I don't know, the last like 10 or 12 years, like that helps a lot. And then just the fact that he was like, all right, I'm down to try it. Like, if you guys think it'll work, let's do it. Um, and so that, that one specifically though, I think the, f- the first sample we got looked kind of weird, but he liked the way they felt. And the second sample, they came in like the midsole was, I think a, mil- a millimeter or two millimeters thicker and he hated them. Like I remember he called me about it and was just like bitching and moaning how these things felt like some chunky shitty DC shoe. And he had, he had like no good things to say about it. I'm like, I know, I know we like the same thing. We're bummed too. I, I don't know why this came back this way, but you know, it's going to take us <laughs> eight weeks to get you like a new workable sample. Yeah. Um, so it, like there's, there's patience there, but like that kind of stuff, although it's not fun to, to hear, like, we have to kind of get that feedback and that sort of honest feedback so we can make changes as quick as possible. Totally. That, I, that's one of the questions I actually wanted to ask you was there, and maybe that's the answer you just said, but like, was there ever a time where you uh, presented something to a skater and they just shit all over it? Like that they were just like, like you were like, here's what, here's what your shoe's going to be, or here's an idea we have for this colorway or whatever. And they were like, that fucking sucks. I hate it. Um, yeah, when it's colorways, I think that happens kind of a lot or like, I'm not really psyched on that. And some people are like, I don't want to do it. Don't do it in my shoe. And other people are like, yeah, it's fine. I'm not going to wear it though. And we're like, oh yeah, it doesn't matter. Gotcha. Um, but as far as like presenting new footwear concepts, I don't think, I don't think we've gotten to a point like early on where it's been like that risky. It's more like, Hey, here's a bunch of options. We're thinking, do any of these strike you? Gotcha. Not like we're really in love with this concept kind of, you know, what do you think? Like if they don't do it, if, you know, if we have an idea that we we really like, which even for that clear bottom, it was something that I think we were developing on the side for about a year before even pitching it to Anthony. But we also felt like, you know, he would be receptive to it. Yeah. That makes sense. So you, 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 you set it up in a way so you're not giving yourself an all or nothing situation where you're not just like, we put everything into this one shoe. Here's your shoe. Yeah, do you love yeah, it or, or do like, you hate it? Everything rides on this one meeting. Otherwise, we're just totally screwed this season. I know. And then you get fired and then you're crying. It's this awful thing. That sounds like a terrible way to do that. Exactly. <laughs> that makes sense that Vans knows how to do this a little better. Um, I was going to ask that too. In general, So you've been working for Vans for 12 years. Vans as a company has grown yeah, hugely in the last 12 years. What's uh, What's it been like as far as like the culture of the company and things like – 
just uh, working at a company that was, you know, this big to now this big or whatever the, you know, the change has been? Um, I mean, they were still pretty big when I started. I think there was like maybe 300 some employees when I started in the corporate office. And now it might be closer to like 700. We've moved buildings to a much larger building. They're actually building a second building behind ours because, well, before COVID, we were actually hiring people. I don't think we're hiring people anymore. Yeah, that, that growth has been interesting. Now I feel like I walk around the building and I just don't recognize as many people as I used to. Yeah. Um, but at least within the footwear department, like my boss has been there, um, you know, since I was an intern, all of the leadership above him, like the kind of the, the VP of development, the VP of, of product, the VP of design, the VP of merchandising, they've all been there, like, you know, 10, 15 years, some even more. So um, although it's, we've grown quite a bit and there's a lot more you know, people around us in the department and in the building, the kind of the, the I'd say at least where we are in footwear, there's a lot of the same faces um, around, even people that are like at a similar level to me that have been there 10 years, 12 years. So that, that I think there's just like a nice security around that, like people like it there and they don't, you know, they don't leave as often as maybe other companies. Yeah, no, that's a good sign, I think. And plus, I mean, dude, as long as Steve Van Doren's there, then everyone, I feel like, will stay happy, right? Yeah, he doesn't stop, man. I think he's probably, like, the most bum person that we're not traveling and not doing stuff because he, that was his whole thing. He would just go around and stoke people out, and he really wanted to, like, talk to everybody, whether it be people in store or in skate shops or the consumers. Like, he just was, like, really a man of the people. Yeah, can you imagine? I, I mean – as I get older, I just get crankier and I'm like, can you imagine being like 70 something and wanting to like get on a plane for like 15 hours and go to China and get out and like talk to like people about shooting, just like being excited to do that in that age yeah. seems he's a, he's a one of a kind really. I agree. I, I I'm with you too. I, I, I don't know how he does it, man. That'll, that dude, like when we, we used to do the Vans warp tour, he would go to like all those warp tours tour stops. So it'd be like a whole summer and he he genuinely loved it and he was just all about it and like it's like you got to give that guy as much credit as possible because he was just super psyched to be there super psyched to talk to every person he could and like he has no off switch crazy he really is like the heart and soul of vans like for, from my perspective it's like van doren is like the dude you're like oh man he seems like the guy who he kind of sets the culture for everything or you know it's it's really like he's such an important piece of the puzzle you know yeah you're right i think we have we have like um there's like awards, like internal awards. And one of them is like Van Doren spirit. And it really is just like dedicated to people who are like, you know, kind of in, in Steve, sh like, um, you know, act like Steve as much as possible and like really exhibiting that character. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that, makes, that makes sense. Um, well, I guess uh, we were going to talk about a little more, but we're kind of going a little longer than I thought. It's been really good, but uh, I want to give people a chance to ask some questions before yes. uh, we get too late. I know people have to go to bed and stuff. So I'm just going to go down the line uh, you guys, and I'm going to unmute people one at a time and give you a chance to kind of like say hi and ask a question. If you don't want to, you can say, I don't want to ask a question. Don't talk to me. That's fine. But uh, I'm going to start with a, uh, all I see for the name here is CC. Is it CC? Yes, it's CC. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Neil? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Um, so I guess a lot of the questions I had kind of have been answered, but I'm a big fan of Vans. Um, for a number of reasons, but I like a shoe that tells a story or has a story behind it. That's one of like a big deal for me. Cause I mean, anybody can wear, you know, the exact copy of the same shoe, but it's nice that it has a story. And so listening to the fact that you have to work so far out, how do you come up with a concept that you think it's going to stay fresh for 18 months? Do you just kind of revise that over those 18 months or well there's so that i'd say there's a couple things so we have kind of a whole one consumer insights department that sort of does this like long-term planning so they're they're talking to consumers um all around the world usually in like larger cities and that's sort of looking at like larger trends among the youth way people are shifting they also have like trend services that do that too and it's everything from like you know um TikTok is a platform that everybody's on and kids of a certain age love this. And, you know, I'm, I'm 38, I'm not on TikTok, but it's like good for me to be aware of that. Um, so we have, we have kind of services like that. There's also, we used to travel regularly before we would start a season. So the season spring 22 that I just mentioned, um, if COVID wasn't happening, um, we would have probably had either like um, a domestic trip or potentially an international trip 
to kind of go to cities and we would like go to, you know, you'd go to like art museums and you'd understand what's happening in that world. And a lot of that isn't all that scripted. It's just like, hey, there's a, a show of so-and-so at um, the MoMA in New York. Like, let's just see it. And they, like, you just start taking pictures and anything could kind of inspire you. Um, or, you know, it's just like a shopping trip to a similar city. So you could go to New York as well. And there's a ton of boutiques there. There's a ton of rad skate shops. There's just like influential people walking around in many cities like that. So people can kind of pull inspiration from wherever in that way too. Like some people kind of within our design department, they, they don't necessarily do like those standard big cities either. And they, they'll try to go to like maybe a little bit more off the beaten path places where, you know, you're looking where like maybe other brands or other big companies aren't necessarily looking for inspiration too. So I don't know if this is the greatest answer, but it kind of, you know, inspiration can kind of come from anywhere. And it just depends on like what you find and then, you know, how you translate it and craft it into that story in a pair of, pair of shoes. No, no, that that's dope. Thanks a lot. Appreciate sure. that. Yeah, right. Thank you, Cece. Appreciate you coming by. All right. Next up, we got Mike. First of all, thanks for just like taking the time to do this and including us. It's super rad and uh, just stoked to be a part of it. Um, so, yeah, thanks for taking the time. Also, Matt uh big fan of your photos and your work and also looking forward to issue three of golden hour so oh, you're gonna make me blush over here man <laughs> <laughs> big fan but anyway um basically the thing i'm wondering is that vans has such like a heritage story and like and has so much history so for you being a footwear designer especially at the level you are do you like do you ha ever have challenging days where you're just like man, I really want to design something like really innovative and like off the wall, uh, no pun intended, I guess. Um, but like, do you ever feel like you're kind of held back a little bit just from having to abide by like the brand standards and the look and feel of everything in that way? Or do you feel like it pushes you to, or are you learning new stuff every day? And are you like saying, I mean, I'm sure you're stoked, but like, do you ever feel held back by just like the way that the brand presents itself? That's a great question. Um, I think I, I agree with what you're saying in a lot of ways because the brand is so heritage based, but that in itself kind of presents, um, you know, a design challenge or a business challenge to where um, the story has to be pretty strong to kind of, you know, one to get past sort of the internal group to make them understand what, you know, what something is, why there's value to it, and then sort of relay that to consumers in the same way. And we've had, you know, we've had kind of like failures where we've had to go back to the drawing board. Like um, Matt mentioned the Ultra Range Pro um, previously. And like that, that shoe, that shoe was kind of like the skate version of that was really only there to help validate the technology and sort of like a reason for being and a reason for that outsole exists, mostly for the lifestyle shoe, which happened in surf. And so they, the surf group kind of pitched this whole concept of like, you know, it's a lightweight multi-purpose shoe. It's not a running shoe, but it's versatile. It's got traction. It's like kind of ideal for surfers as they travel the world and, you know, anybody that might be out there, but they initially sold that in, in the season that they started designing it and sort of, they didn't get the buy off that they thought they did. So they kind of had to go back to the drawing board, revise the designs, kind of recraft the story. And with that came like, well, if we had, you know, a skate shoe doing the same thing, you know, or, you know, validating that same kind of outsole technology and construction, that would kind of help. And so we added a, a skate version of that in that next season as they kind of crafted their story and built that out a little bit more. Then the company bought in on it. Um, we were able to sell it in. And that's like, that's like kind of a, I don't know how many pairs we sell of that but we sell a lot and it's sort of like a, a growing franchise that's not classics based um and so we were able to kind of prove that there was value in something new there but it you know it, it does take some time and it takes some like real thought and um you know defining a white space and a consumer and looking for a real insight from a consumer to have something really um, exist in that way we do that almost season in season out and you know the, the thing that we were just talking about with anthony van england the ave pro that like matt was saying like this doesn't really look like a band shoe having someone like anthony sort of validate it and say like no this thing works for me i like it i'm actually skating in it that goes a long way too to kind of one help 
the internal group that might be skeptical, but then also like help the, the consumer and skateboarders know that we actually believe in it. That's rad. Yeah. So it's like, it, it's almost like it's a challenge in itself to get that innovative technology kind of growing on its own, but telling it through the van's lens. Yeah. I think, I think that's like a good way to put it is like, we can, you know, we can do running shoes or silhouettes that look like, uh, you know, one of the big athletic brands, but to really make it feel like it's something different and something that, that would work for the van's consumer. Um, that's probably like one of the hardest parts. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a never ending challenge. So I guess there's job security in that. All right, no worries. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Adam, how's it going? Yeah, we yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing great. I'm on the East coast. So it's kind of late for me. Oh uh, shit, man. I, sorry. I, sorry. <laughs> no, Adam, it's I, not your fault. I had to put my kids to bed. <laughs> my kids are too old to be put to bed, but uh, Hey, uh, <laughs> Uh, I really uh, love all the stuff that you guys are doing lately. Uh, as an older guy, I like the uh, the new a lot of the new pro stuff because it's got, like you said, the better cushioning, better support. Right. What do you? Uh, and I don't really have too many questions, but uh, uh, what do you? Uh, how long do you design a shoe to last for? Like I can wear a shoe for like two years before I wear it out because because <laughs> you know I don't have any flip tricks or anything. But uh, you know, kind of what's the the range of you know what you're looking for? What is what's acceptable? Um, I don't, I don't think we have like a kind of a set end point. Um, you know, there's, there's certain people on the team that'll skate shoes for three days and then be done with them. Um, just based on the way they like their footwear. Um, but yeah. I think for us, it's like durability is super important in a skate shoe. And especially if we're going to, we're going to charge a little bit more than a classic, we want it to last like a lot longer than what we're charging for that. I, I don't know of like a set end point, but like durability is definitely something we focus on, which is why we've tried to have like, upgraded um, rubber, having that footbed that's not gonna kind of pack out. Like in the case of the Pro Classics, we've added, I think, Duracap, which is that rubber reinforcement, like in the high wear areas and the forefoot um, to kind of help those things last longer. You know, even if you're blowing ollie holes in a, in a canvas quarter panel, like there's still rubber behind it to help that thing last a little bit longer. Can I chime in real quick? Cause I actually pulled these out of my car today for this talk. Please do. I've been skating this pair of authentic pros for three months and I've skated more in the last three months than I've skated in like the last five years. I've just been skating a ton. And I am like, I'm always blown away that this is an authentic and it skates and feels like an authentic and I've skated it for three months and I don't even have a hole. And like, I don't know the, the, the pro classic series to me is like a total, fucking gem like i'm just, like the fact that i can skate in authentics and they don't just disappear after a week is like crazy so whatever you guys did there with the dirt cap and the, and the ultra kush you know i'm a fan of the ultra kush souls but just to, yeah yeah you know sorry adam you brought up a point that i was already planning on wanting to sh show and tell because <laughs> i was excited <laughs> I, i'll agree with you i do like the dirt cap i mean you know i don't i don't get off the ground much but when i do it doesn't even leave a mark anymore so you know that's, that's pretty awesome I'm That's used to right. wearing, you know, when I was a kid, I had canvas shoes that have a hole in like two days. So, but that was in the eighties. You all don't remember the eighties probably. <laughs> all right, last, qu <laughs> last question. Uh, what beer are you drinking? Uh, this is, there's a brewing company called Kern River Brewing Company. Okay. It's like, it's, it's like a little town in the Southern Sierras, but I went to the grocery store and um, I, I, I used to like fly fishing before I had kids. And every time I would go fishing in that river, I'd stop at this brewery and get some beers on the way home. But the, the grocery store by my house had some, so I bought a six pack of this. It's just their IPA. Sweet. Thanks for taking my questions. Yeah, um, no worries. Appreciate it. Thanks, nice. Adam. All right. How's it going? Good. How are y'all? Good, good. Very good. Thank y'all so much for doing this. This is a blast. Of course. Thanks for coming. Enjoying this a lot. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Neil, did you work on the Skate High Pro? Um, yeah, the, yeah, I have. Um, mostly just like... So in, well, what's your question beyond just did I work on it? Uh, I love the design. I love the black and gum particularly. Sick. Um, I'm always a sucker for the gum sole. Um, I was wondering, the thing that caught my eye when I saw these, funny enough, is the eyelet, mm -hmm. the top eyelet, the metal. Yeah. And I'm just wondering about the design on that, if that's something that you had any input on. Um, it's just details like that that, catch my eye like it has pro imprinted on it yeah and then there's like this cutaway just past like the halfway point it just is really interesting design so yeah. that 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 specifically that eyelet was something we try to use as like one of the little identifiers to help people understand what the, the pro classics were versus the regular classics sure so a, yeah. lot, a lot of the shoes have that little silver eyelet at the top and 
I don't know if it actually ended up functioning how we intended, but there was that, you know, that little midpoint design detail that you keyed in on that was supposed to be a recess. So your lace could kind of sit in there and like, as you know, the yeah. tape rubbed on it, it would help save your lace a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of like another longevity durability thing. Um, but I'd say in, I think in 2015, we, we had relaunched the pro classics range and mm-hmm. the, the current design that you probably have is, um, a part of that and we had like a, a thinner foxing so a single piece construction the um ultra cush hd footbeds duracap and then we kind of like tweaked the upper pattern because I, I i can't really say i've ever designed a skate high but i've adjusted a few skate highs sure, in my yeah. days to make them kind of fit different lasts or different shapes or for different insoles so um yeah i, I did i did that much uh to those shoes coming spring 21 so beginning of next year we're, we're doing kind of like another refresh on the Mm -hmm. whole pro classics range so there'll be like subtle pattern updates we're gonna have um these pop cush footbeds which is like a version of of what's in that shoe but with a little higher energy return so if you think about kind of like skating for a three hour session or whatever and you're flexing kind of up and down as you're getting ready to pop for tricks the material will kind of return more energy back to you so in theory you'll be less fatigued over the length of a session um, we've tried to reinforce the bottom a little bit more. So we've gone back to like a two part foxing. We've got a little kind of shank in the bottom. So it adds a little bit more structural support to the heel. Um, if anyone's familiar with the Rowan pro that we came out with earlier this year, that has an, like a, an adjusted rubber compound on the outsole. It's meant to be grippier and more durable. So that's going to be a part of all the new pro classics. So we're kind of, kind of always tinkering with these things. Um, and it's, it's, it's a difficult thing because it takes a while for us to get feedback on, on shoes sometimes, but then after, you know, the seasons and the years go by, we'll start to hear like little fit concerns or the way things are breaking down. And then we're always kind of trying to find ways to, to kind of improve things and make it better. Sure. Yeah. One more question, just yeah. in general on the soles. Mm-hmm. Like on this one, there's a there's like a black stripe on the top, which I really like. Kind of breaks up the the color, and then um, you know, like the toe, it has this uh, texture. Like there's the I don't know what you refer to this as, but oh, it's like a, here. like a neural texture. Yeah. How how much of this design is you know structural for comfort for um, performance and then how much of it is just aesthetic um i'd say a lot of that stuff is like kind of purely aesthetic because on Mm -hmm. something like those pro classics range we're we're really trying to cue back to like when the skate highs and old schools and things like that were originally designed so we're looking at like made in usa details and we're trying to match like some um taller outsole heights Mm -hmm. making stripe be a little thicker a little deeper in color and even some of that goes back to durability where like as you skate and wear it away, it'll, we're, we're hoping it lasts a little bit longer so you get that visual longer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Vans, Vans has always had that neural texture around the toe bumper, so especially mm-hmm. if it's a classic shoe, I mean, you know, nine out of 10 times, they're gonna have that. It's just a cue back to the heritage piece. But yeah, even like like the, the bottom of those, I think that the tread depth is slightly thicker than classics. It might only be half a millimeter, but mm-hmm. it was another detail we were referring back to the old made in USA stuff when things were just a little bit thicker, a little bit gummier. Um, yeah. Everybody kind of romanticizes their old made in USA vans. So like, those are some of the cues we want to get back to, even if it's just aesthetic, it's like those, those things that like maybe the consumer can't put their, put their, um, you know, put their finger on, but they're like, I like yeah. it. It looks, it looks better in some way, even though I may not know specifically why. The, I know this is every day for you, but this is just fascinating stuff really enjoy hearing about it yeah no problem i'm psyched to share i mean nobody really asks these questions in depth people are usually sick of hearing right. me to talk about shoes thank <clears> you <throat> all so much i appreciate all right. it thanks cal yeah. appreciate you coming thanks back for staying up with us well sick i guess we will uh we will sign off uh from you guys here we'll call it a night we'll let all all you guys go to bed um, does anyone have anything else though any bonus questions i just found it interesting that when you guys were talking about your kind of story um through school and just like starting to work for vans it kind of reminded me of like what every skater goes through as far as like sponsorship and stuff that when you got pretty much told 
you know, during your internship and while you were going to school, like, hey, you should just go to school out here and like just work here at the same mm-hmm. time. What was there any specific reason that you felt like you should hold off in that instance? Because I feel like, you know, kids growing up and starting to get sponsorships, a lot of them stop going to school to like pursue that dream because you get too old and you can't do it when you're older. So I'm kind of wondering, since it's so similar, what made you want to stay like in school and then and then later on it ended up paying off? Well, I think just for my field, having a bachelor's degree is kind of important and makes me a lot more employable even, even with an amount of experience. Um, I, I think I was maybe joking a little bit earlier when I, when, you know, there was like this open offer for me to stay. I don't know if that actually would have been the case. I probably could have figured something else, put something out and they might've um, found a way to keep me. But I think it was just easier. Like I had a girlfriend back in Arizona. We're now married. Um, I already had sort of like the fall semester lined up. And even at that point I was like, oh, I have next summer to try a different internship to see what I like. I I always kind of thought like having my degree would be super important. Like neither of my parents got college degrees. So I thought that would just be something that would help set me up in the future a little bit more. Um, I can't really speak to like the skate sponsorship side of things. Like I I personally am always psyched when I hear about skaters going to college and finishing school. Um, I I think it's kind of a shame when you have like young skaters um, dropping out of high school and trying to pursue a dream which is, it's, you know, it's rad that they can do that, but I, I also wonder if they can do it now without, without potentially having to like move to California to make it. And like, you can kind of do it a little bit more through their own cities. But I, me personally, like I always knew I was going to go back, finish my degree. Um, I was just kind of fortunate in that I was able to kind of come back to Vans and they had something available for me. That's awesome, man. I'm stoked it yeah. paid off and congrats on that. All the Thank hard you. work paid off. Thank you so cool. much. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Mike. But we are done. Thank you guys for stopping by. I appreciate it. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you for staying for, up and listening to me. Yeah, thanks for supporting CCS Plus. We really appreciate it. We're going to do more of these things. Uh, the more the more you guys show up to them, the more we're going to do. So.